The Spinosaurus is arguably the most iconic theropod to have ever existed in the prehistoric world. Well, with the sole exception of Tyrannosaurus rex, of course. However, the Spinosaurus was separated from the Tyrant Lizard King by a vast ocean and millions of years worth of time. G'day mates, I'm your host, and today we'll be talking about how Spinosaurus aegypticus would hold up in North America's Hell's Creek Formation during the Cretaceous period. As always, we have the normal scoring system of environment, diet, and resistance to threats and competition. These will all be scored out of 10 before for being added up for an ultimate survival score. Before we get started, make sure to like and subscribe so I don't end up extinct like the creatures in these videos, and let's get the ball rolling. So, prior to the end of the reign of the dinosaurs, few predators were as bizarre or as imposing as Spinosaurus aegypticus. Built unlike any megatheropod, this animal pushed the limits of what large carnivorous dinosaurs could look like. Estimates place it at roughly 14 meters or 46 feet in length, around 7 to 8 tons in mass, standing 2.4 meters or 7.8 feet at the hips, and when its massive neural spines are included, the animal may have reached close to 5 meters or 16 feet in height. The skull of Spinosaurus was similar to its family, being long, narrow, and packed with conical teeth, more closely resembling a crocodile than a typical land-based theropod. Rising from its back was a tall sail formed by elongated vertebral spines, an anatomical feature still debated today. With a use for display or heating regulation, the sail made Spinosaurus immediately recognizable from great distances, and it likely played a role in social behavior. But going back to its skull structure, the Spinosaurus jaws were well suited for its specialized lifestyle of fish hunting. Unsurprisingly, its bite force was not extreme when compared to the bone-crushing bite of Tyrannosaurus rex, but people often underestimate it. Estimates suggest an interior bite force of around 4,800 newtons and a posterior bite force exceeding 11,000 newtons. Just think about it, a bite on a set of jaws that were over 5 feet long would be more than enough to do some serious damage. However, as stated before, with its teeth being conical in shape, it did lack serrations, which allowed it to be well suited for puncturing prey and holding it into place. These features provided the Spinosaurus with the ability to be the Jeremy Wade of theropods, yet it would still have enough power to go head to head with other dinosaurs if need be. Complementing its jaws were the Spinosaurus's unusually powerful forelimbs and claws, which were far more developed than those of other giant theropods. Rather than functioning as primary weapons, it seems that these claws acted more as secondary tools, assisting to stabilize prey. I mean, while their arms were longer than most other theropods, they weren't to the point of being as proportionally large to be as useful as, let's say, human arms. While not designed to disembowel heavily armored dinosaurs, these forelimbs still gave Spinosaurus a physical advantage in close quarters encounters and reinforced its role as a predator. Where this theropod truly stands unique is its relationship with water. Though exactly how aquatic it was remains controversial, I think it's not too far-fetched to say it was a capable swimmer. Even if it wasn't perfect, it could certainly outswim what North America had to offer. On land, however, that was a different story. Spinosaurus was far from graceful. Its shortened hind limbs, elongated torso, giant tail, and massive sails suggest that it was not built for efficient terrestrial movement. As in alignment with my previous Spinosaur video, I think that under 20 kilometers an hour or 12 miles per hour is a more than fair speed to place it at. To be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if it was under 15 kilometers an hour or 9 miles per hour. Cognitively speaking, Spinosaurus was on par with other large theropods. Studies of its related family unsurprisingly reveal the brain structure was typical of predatory dinosaurs. Efficient, but nothing to be overly jealous about. Notably, they show that this family of theropods likely had quite advanced head and eye stabilization. This shouldn't be surprising considering that they would have needed this adaptation to track prey in the water. Dietary evidence points it strongly to being episcopal. This theropod would have likely targeted fish that could reach a ton in weight. That being said, just because it would have eaten a lot of fish doesn't mean it could only eat fish. Smaller dinosaurs, wounded larger dinosaurs, and even other predators may have been taken opportunistically. A related spinosaur tooth embedded in a pterosaur vertebrae highlights just how flexible its feeding habits could be. This spined lizard also lived alongside other massive predators, including Deltadromaeus, Abelosaurids, and of course, Caracodontosaurus. While each theropod's diets likely reduced direct competition with Spinosaurus, there is no doubt the occasional bout would occur. Being that the Spinosaurus and the Caracodontosaurus were of similar sizes and respective apex predators, it would not surprise me if confrontations between the two were entirely environment dependent. Combined with disputes between rival Spinosaurus and 
individuals, these confrontations ensure that Spinosaurus was no stranger to conflict with large dangerous animals, an experience that would have shaped both its behavior and survival strategies. But before we drop this dinosaur straight into this new ecosystem, we need to strip away the familiar image of the ecosystem being solely known as T-Rex country. North America during the late Cretaceous was a dynamic water-shaped landscape, one that in many ways played directly into Spinosaurus's strengths. The region experienced a warm, humid climate marked by strong seasonal weather. Peak summer months, temperatures may have pushed towards 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, while cooler seasons remained mild enough to support the ecosystem's animals year-round. It was a patchwork of interconnected habitats. You had slow-moving rivers, extensive wetlands, marshes, as well as shallows, conifer forests, and many other types of lands. Mainly, the aquatic corridors offered concealment, mobility, and access to prey while limiting exposure to larger terrestrial competitors. In many ways, Hell's Creek waterways would be a paradise for Spinosaurus. From an environmental standpoint, this ecosystem would have been surprisingly accommodating for a semi-aquatic predator of Spinosaurus's size. The climate, vegetation density, and abundance of water well aligns with its adaptations. I would give Spinosaurus's environmental survivability in Hell's Creek a solid 8 out of 10. So when you drop a megatheropod like Spinosaurus into a new ecosystem, it doesn't just raise questions about the climate or terrain. Instead, it forces us to confront the animals that would have made up its diet. And this ecosystem had no shortage of animals. The environment was packed with prey that could pose no problems, all the way to holding prey that could send it to an early grave. So what would have made the bulk of its diet? Well, unsurprisingly, I believe that aquatic life would fulfill the majority of its stomach content. Aquatic prey and semi-aquatic prey would have been its bread and butter. Large fish, including sturgeon-like forms, gars, rayfish, and others, were abundant in Hell's Creek's rivers and wetlands. These animals match Spinosaurus's anatomy perfectly. Its long jaws, conical teeth, and bite designed to grip rather than crush would have made the perfect tools to fish in this area. There would have also been a few turtle species that could have been on its radar. Adokus and others were not necessarily gigantic, but could grow several feet in size, making good snacks for younger spinos. As for the crocs that inhabited the area, there were three central species. This included Borealisuchus, Thoracosaurus, and Brachychamsa. Apologies for butchering any names there. As far as we know, they weren't Sarcosuchus sized, being more around the size of modern crocodilians. In the waterways, Spinosaurus wouldn't need speed, it would need patience. Shallow water ambushes, shoreline strikes, and dominance over fishing territories would allow it to exploit a food source that many terrestrial predators couldn't access efficiently. Young Spinos would have also likely targeted the pterosaurs in the area, the central of which in this ecosystem was Inferno Dracon, a human sized Azarchid. Now we are onto the less likely prey options being the large herbivores. The most likely out of the bunch would have been Edmontosaurus. Now, do I think that Spinosaurus would go ahead and hunt a 10 ton Edmontosaurus? No. However, smaller adults or juveniles would have been possible prey options, especially during hardy times. Despite this herbivore lacking physical equipment of their contemporary herbivores, they still had enough power to charge down most dinosaurs. And if there was a carnivore that wouldn't want to be knocked off balance, it would be Spinosaurus. Of course, moving on from that, we had the Ceratopsians, which were the most notable herbivores of this formation. Triceratops and Taurosaurus, both herbivores that could exceed 9 meters or 30 feet in length and 9 tons in weight, would have been unlikely prey options. Their forward-facing brow horns and frill would have been a big deterrent for a hungry Spinosaurus. Plus, given that they were even more agile than Tyrannosaurus rex, which is noted to be one of the most agile theropods for its size, does not give too much hope for a Spinosaurus getting a successful hunt, at least on an adult. Then of course, we have the Ankylosaurus, an animal that should not be attacked by anything relying on finesse. Roughly 6 meters or 20 feet in length and weighing around 5 tons, it was wrapped head to tail in heavy osteoderms. Its low center of gravity made it almost impossible to topple, and its club tail could provide some pretty bad injuries. The spiner's elongated jaws and gripping teeth were not suited for penetrating armor or delivering disabling trauma through thick plating. Like Ceratopsians, adults would be functionally off limits. Now we have the smaller bunch of dinosaurs, and though they wouldn't pose too much of a threat, they still wouldn't be on the main menu. Being so small and fast, they would be outside what an adult would be able to effectively hunt. Sure, a young spino might catch an ornithomimid here and there, but it wouldn't be a common occurrence. These dinosaurs were just too fast, alert, and well adapted to fleeing. Catching them would be situational rather than reliable. 
So when we understand Spinosaurus's dietary prospects in this ecosystem, the picture is mixed. Large, well-defended herbivores are not first in line, and small and fast dinosaurs are inconsistent targets, so we would have to focus on aquatic prey. Clearly, aquatic prey is where the Spinosaurus would thrive. Adding juvenile dinosaurs, scavenging opportunities, and the occasional opportunistic takedown, it could sustain itself, although not effortlessly. So, I think that the Spinosaurus owns a dietary score of around 6 out of 10. It does have a viable diet, but heavily dependent on water access and niche separation. So with that, that makes up two thirds of the equation. This formation was not just crowded with potential mules, it was already home to some of the most efficient predators to have ever walked on the land. But could many of the carnivals of this area compete with Spinosaurus? The short answer? Well, no. But for the long answer, smaller drovisaurs like Archiraptor didn't stand a chance. Dakotaraptor, the formation's largest raptor if it was real and you know, not a chimera, would not do too much to anything but a juvenile spino. Nanotyrannus would have sort of been in the same boat. The nano would be too small to compete with adult Spinosaurus and would likely have its meals contested over and over again, almost like what bears do to wolves or lions to hyenas. That of course leaves the classic Jurassic Park 3 showdown. Tyrannosaurus Rex stands as the pinnacle of megatheropods, being the only predator in this ecosystem that could actually challenge the newcomer. And unlucky for our spiny lizard, if a conflict were to occur, it would not stand too much of a chance. As a terrestrial predator, the Tyrant Lizard King just has it outstanded in every area. It is heavier at 8 to 12 tons, has a bite force that can be above 40,000 newtons, it had the binocular vision of a hawk and the smelling capability that a bloodhound could only dream of. On top of that, it was one of the most intelligent and agile megatheropods. Rex glazing aside, the spino would likely have to stick to waterbound areas to ensure that conflict was not a common occurrence. I would provide the Spinosaurus a resistance to threats and competition score of 6 out of 10. It would have to face a lot of different competitors throughout its life. The crocs and smaller theropods when young, and then the Tyrannosaurus rex as it aged up. At no point would it be particularly easy. But now we are onto the speculative side of things. The first evolutionary branch of Spinosaurus in this ecosystem would naturally push it further into the aquatic niche. This species, which will cause Spinosaurus aquaticus, would become increasingly specialized for life in rivers, wetlands, and flood channels, rather than directly competing with terrestrial apex predators. Because this area simply would not support a multi-ton semi-aquatic predator at full Spinosaurus size, this species would undergo a moderate reduction in mass. Adults would now top out at around 11 meters or 36 feet in length and reach roughly around 4 tons in weight. This downsizing would lower energetic demands while improving maneuverability in water, an essential trade-off in a resource competitive environment. Over time, Aquaticus would refine its swimming adaptations. The tail would broaden and become more muscular, functioning as its primarily propulsive structure, while the tall dorsal sail would slightly reduce the cut drag and improve stability in the water. Its forelimbs would also lengthen and strengthen, becoming highly useful tools rather than secondary appendages. In addition to helping secure slippery prey, these arms would act as a backup feeding mechanism, allowing the animal to hook, pin or manipulate fish and aquatic reptiles if its jaws were ever damaged or obstructed. Its feet and hands would also obtain thicker webbing, allowing it to be more proficient when swimming. Ecologically, Spinosaurus aquaticus would occupy a middle tier in Hell's Creek's formation. It would dominate smaller theropods such as Dakotaraptor and Nanotyrannus, but avoid direct competition with Tyrannosaurus rex and the larger, more generalized Spinosaurus species. This separation would reduce conflict and allow it to persist within a narrow but stable niche. Its diet would almost completely be made up of marine life, consisting of large fish and semi-aquatic reptiles, possibly even the odd small mosasaur if it swam up into the region. Because suitable habitats would be limited, populations would remain small and localized. Even so, within its chosen environment, Aquaticus would be a highly successful hunter. The secondary evolution path for Spinosaurus in this ecosystem would push in the opposite direction, away from being a specialized predator and towards raw physical dominance. Inspired by the classic what-if interpretation of a heavily muscled bison-like Spino, this form represents a lineage that abandoned subtlety in favor of brute force. This species would be known as Spinosaurus Imperator. The tall also becomes deeper and broader, muscle mass increases dramatically and the animal shifts towards a more terrestrial confrontational lifestyle, closer to the predator that many imagined Spinosaurus could have been. Fully grown adults would reach around 13 meters or 42 feet in length, stand close to 4.5 meters or 15 feet at the top of its dorsal hump and approach around 10 tons in mass. This would make Imperator one of the heaviest theropods to exist, being built less for endurance and more so for overpowering strength. Its skull shortening and widening compared to the classic Spinosaurus profile, trading reach for durability. 
Combined with a thicker neck and massively developed shoulders, this would push up its bite force and claw effectiveness. Its bite force would now reach around 18,000 newtons, the larger shoulders now anchoring more powerful forelimbs, allowing the animal to grapple, shove, and destabilize prey at close range rather than relying purely on its jaws. Its dietary focus would shift accordingly. Fish would become a secondary food source, taken opportunistically rather than routinely. Instead, Imperator would target large, slow-moving herbivores such as Ankylosaurus, Denvisaurus, Taurosaurus, and Triceratops. Other dinosaurs such as young Edmontosaurs, Ornithomimids, and Pachycephalosaurs would be either too small or too agile to be reliable prey. Hunting the larger herbivores would be a high-risk, high-reward affair, relying on overwhelming force, body mass, and close quarters dominance rather than precision. This form of Spinosaurus wouldn't replace Tyrannosaurus Rex, but it would exist as a competing heavyweight, less specialized, more confrontational, and far less forgiving to anything unlucky enough to be caught within its reach. And now with our spec Evo out of the way, we can move on to the ultimate survival scenario. And of course, if you've enjoyed so far, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel as it helps a bunch. So if a population of Spinosaurs were introduced into the Hell's Creek ecosystem, their success would depend far more on ecological discipline rather than raw power. This ecosystem was already one of the most competitive that the Low Cretaceous could offer, being dominated by highly efficient terrestrial predators and heavily defended by herbivores. For this species to persist, it would need to operate within a narrow but defensible niche. The species would strongly gravitate towards river networks, wetlands, and floodplains, where semi-aquatic adaptations offer a clear advantage. These waterways would serve both as feeding grounds and movement corridors, allowing Spinosaurus to bypass much of the competition that defined open terrestrial spaces. I mean, let's be honest, why travel through terrain inhabited by T-Rex when the rivers would be a much safer path? Large fish, turtles, and semi-aquatic reptiles would form the foundation of its diet. This could be supplemented by scavenging and the occasional capture of juvenile dinosaurs that venture too close to the water's edge. Population density would remain inherently low. The aquatic biomass, while substantial, would not support large number of Spinosaurus occupying the same niche. As a result, Spinosaurus would likely maintain elongated river-based territories rather than overlapping land rages. This structure would reduce intraspecific conflict while also minimizing encounters with apex land predators such as Tyrannosaurus rex. Against smaller theropods such as Dakota Raptor and Anatyrannus, the Spina would dominate through sheer size, being able to intimidate them out of territories or off carcasses. However, against T-Rex, competition would be unsustainable. Individuals that attempted to contest carcasses or territory on open ground would suffer heavy mortality. Well, that is, of course, if they reach combat. The Spino does have an advantage of having an intimidation buff through its spine, making it look larger and more intimidating to an unfamiliar Rex. But realistically, carnivores aren't going at it every other day. They prefer to intimidate or back off. There is no reason to engage in a pointless battle. However, on the odd occasion, it would occur. A large Spino against a large Rex. And if that were to happen, the Spino is not going to come out on top. The Rex pretty much outmuscles it in every way, so unless it's in deep water, the T-Rex would retain itself as the king of the dinosaurs. The reproductive success of the species would hinge on the access to stable aquatic habitats. If aquatic prey became limited, then spiners would be forced to take on the larger herbivores in the ecosystem, and if that were to occur, I think an immense drop to their population would be seen. Their lack of land mobility and experience with these types of dinosaurs would likely lead to them being gored by ceratopsians or receiving a broken bone to an anki. Maybe they could start to work as a group to hunt vast and Montessors, which would provide them an easier source of prey. Even teenage spiners would not be safe. They would have to be wary from adult rexes that would prefer to limit this new source of competition. Over time, these pressures would split the Spinosaurus species down two pathways, one where it becomes a habitat specialist of the waterways being known as Spinosaurus aquaticus. As we know, this species would spend a majority of its time within the water, choosing to take to this area rather than engaging conflict. And if they were to take on Tyrannosaurus rex or the larger Spinosaurus species, then yeah, they would get bolded. On the other side of the coin would be the generalist apex predator known as Spinosaurus Imperator. This theropod would act as a legitimate challenge for the T-Rex, being a bulky bulldog-like Spino. When these two collided, the Rex would still hold favor, but it would not be nearly as one-sided as what Egypticus had to deal with. Thus, the Spinosaurus' presence in Hell's Creek would be sustainable but constrained, likely doing better when populations were on the lower end. Its success would not be measured by its dominance over other dinosaurs, but its ability to consistently exploit aquatic resources while avoiding the ecosystem's most dangerous conflicts. With this, the Spinosaurus earns an ultimate survival score of 20 out of 30. Not too shabby if I say so myself. And with that, we have reached the end of the video and I hope you've all enjoyed. As always, make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what you would like to see next and I'll catch you on the next video. See ya mates.